Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming and for joining our Exploring Ethical Space series. Uh, my name is Nadine Reynolds and I work with the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and Y2Y. And uh, my colleague Brittany LeBlanc is also here from Y2Y and will be supporting this workshop. The landscape we refer to as the Yellowstone to Yukon region encompasses the homelands of many, many Indigenous peoples. Y to Y recognizes and respects the rights of Indigenous peoples and is working to support land based reconciliation and stewardship and Indigenous led conservation across this region. We've had really had tremendous interest in this workshop and in this whole series of events that we started hosting back in fall 22, uh, 2020. And the Exploring Ethical Space series is continuing because of this strong interest. So thank you for coming and continuing to come. Um, and I really, I think that desire uh, to play an educated and active role in truth and reconciliation, uh, both in this region for Columbia and, in, and across British Columbia. And if you're interested in previous sessions, um, ones that you may have missed, and of course, future sessions that are coming, these are recorded and uh, you can find information and resources at our webpage dedicated to this program, y2y.net forward slash ethical space. And uh, I think Brittany will put that in the chat. Uh, it'll also be in a follow-up email. Um, but we're doing this work because it is of utmost importance um, to learn about indigenous worldviews and laws, to build relationships, and really to set ourselves up um, for working together more effectively and to support Indigenous-led conservation. As with some of the other workshops in the series, um, if, if you've been to them, um, but what, what we're seeing is really a lot of sectors represented. Uh, we have local government folks, provincial, territorial, and federal government staff, Indigenous government staff and elected officials, uh, tourism operators and guides, a variety of folks from the business community, conservation NGOs, arts and culture workers, academics, researchers, everyone is welcome. And so we really like to see uh, that diversity come into these. So most folks I think are pretty used to Zoom by now. <laughs> um, we just ask that you keep yourself um, muted when people are presenting uh, and, and except of course in the breakout rooms. And we ask that you keep your cameras on during the Q&A session. Um, we will have you ask your questions verbally, but we can also use the chat for questions and comments. So today we have two presenters. We'll do a Q&A session and then there'll be an opportunity for discussion in small groups. So our first speaker is, is the Mo Nado, the one to my left in the screen. You could just wave Mo. I think a few other people are signed in as, as Mo Nado because of the link. Um, uh, but Mo is a resource and environmental management master's student at Simon Fraser University. And she lives on Dene, Shaquatmik, and Dakel Keho lands uh, near Gavin Lake, BC. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Um, Mo's research focuses on supporting planners to advance equity in land use planning. And specifically, Mo interrogates previous decision making processes in BC through the application of an ethical space framework. Mo has a strong interest in land use planning from both an indigenous rights and conservation lens. She's been involved in projects related to community-based planning and advancing indigenous relationships uh, within the recreation industry. Mo was one of the main uh, researchers who completed the work on best practices and creating readiness for land use planning in the Upper Columbia, which is a project that Y2Y partnered with Selkirk College on. And we'll put that in the chat there for you too. Um, those who are interested in, in community-based planning, this is a resource. And we have a re recording of, of a presentation from Mo and uh, Lauren Rethray from Selkirk College that you might be interested in as well. And our other important guest here today is Elaine Alec. I wanna give a little wave, Elaine. People will probably see your name. Uh, Elaine is from Silks Okanagan Nation and Chushwap Nation and is a member of the Menticton Indian Band in the interior of present day British Columbia. She's been a political advisor, chief of staff for the BC Assembly of First Nations, community planner for her own First Nation, employee 
of the province of BC and the government of Canada, and she's an entrepreneur. Elaine has spent over 20 years in 100 plus communities across Canada, promoting healing and wellness. She is a partner in Alder Hill Planning Inc., an indigenous owned and operated planning company, and as a first time author, Calling My Spirit Back is her memoir of growing up as an Indigenous girl in Canada and the impacts of colonization, and also provides Indigenous knowledge and teachings on how to cultivate safe spaces for diversity and inclusion. And Elaine is going to share with us today some examples of her work with love-based practices in community planning. And Brittany's just put uh, Elaine's web page in, uh, in the chat there too, and we'll provide these in a follow-up email as well. So um, let's give a warm welcome to Mo and Elaine. And I will um, hand it over to you, Mo. Awesome, thanks Naveen. Okay, so I'm just gonna sh go ahead and share my screen. Can you see that okay, Nadine? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so, Hi everybody, it's it's really great to see so many people on the call today and, and thanks for coming out and listening to myself and Elaine chat. We're excited to have you here. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the lands of the Dene, Chiquetmec, and Del Kel Keo peoples from which I'm presenting on, as Nadine mentioned, at Gavin Lake. Um, I'm very honored to be a guest on their lands in this beautiful space and to present here uh, from here with you today. So, let's see if that's working. There we go. Um, so my research is titled Exploring Ethical Space for Land Use Planning in the Upper Columbia Region of British Columbia. My research was conducted at Simon Fraser University in the Resource and Environmental Management thesis stream. Today for you, I'm going to first introduce my research and explain its significance and talk a little bit about my research aims. Next, I'll briefly speak to my literature review and the research, research methods that I used for my research. And then I'll break down my results um, pertaining to my two aims, talk, and I'll discuss them and talk about how they're situated um, in an applied case study setting. Then I'll conclude the presentation with a few recommendations for the Upper Columbia. So first I wanna explain why I chose uh, to conduct this research. And I'm gonna start with a quote by Leanne Simpson. So Leanne says, I don't think we are having the right conversations in this country. The root causes of every issue that indigenous peoples are facing in Canada comes from dispossession, erasure, and the system of settler colonialism that keeps us in an occupied state. And to me, this quote really highlights how land use planning contributes to Indigenous dispossession. Land use planning regulates land and resources using non-Indigenous practices, including zoning, bylaws, and assumed jurisdiction. And historically, planning has really focused on maintaining social order, stability, and certainty. But indig Indigenous decision-making doesn't operate using all of these methods, and decisions are made collaboratively with consideration for all living things and storytelling and kinship guide responsibilities to the land. Yet in BC, these practices aren't considered in planning. Now, planners are beginning to reflect on some of these broader implications for their work and taking steps to advance reconciliation. So for example, the Canadian Institute of Planners adopted the policy on planning practice and reconciliation which outlines the roles planners play in advancing reconciliation. Um, they've also begun celebrating National Indigenous History Month, which is something that wouldn't have happened even five years ago. And these conversations largely began from the development of two guiding documents. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which sets out the minimum standards for the survival and well-being of all Indigenous peoples, and the Truth and Reconciliation's 94 Calls to Action, which outlines specific actions for Canada to take to advance reconciliation. And so this is where BC planning perspectives come in. Um, BC formally adopted the UNDRIP principles into legislation in 2019 through Bill 41. 
the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And this was monumental because it provided a legislative framework for recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples in BC. And in March of this year, BC released the DRIPA Action Plan, which has 89 priority actions um, to be implemented over the next five years. And numerous actions in that plan specifically relate to land use. So through DRIPA, the province committed to developing a new planning framework, which is called the Modernized Land Use Planning Program. And it involves deep collaboration with Indigenous governments to, to um, conduct decision making. Now, some advancements have been made through this program. However, its success is largely based on its ability to adopt new methods of collaboration and decision making. So, for my research, I focused on the Upper Columbia, which is a region that's in need of modernized land use planning efforts. Um, many things are happening in this area. For example, um, it's experienced a surge of tourism and recreation use. It's also expected to experience greater climate resiliency compared to other locations in BC, making it important for plants and animals. And Columbia River Dam treaty negotiations are currently happening, meaning that watercourse impacts and rights might be changing in the area. So with all of these and more, the Upper Columbia um, is really in need of updated planning measures. And I specifically chose ethical space because I think that it might present a practical framework to respond to this need for updated planning practices in BC. Ethical space is a conceptual approach. It's used to balance power dynamics and meaningfully develop relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So it operates under the understanding that all knowledge systems are distinct and equal, and it encourages re respectful collaboration and ethical decision-making. Now, my research has two aims. First, to investigate how an ethical space framework could be applied to land use planning. And second, to offer an exploratory application of ethical space for land use planning in the Upper Columbia. So to achieve those aims, I first analyzed three bodies of literature. I reviewed Indigenous planning, which is a practice that strives to reclaim Indigenous planning using historical, contemporary, and future lenses place-based understanding and community development. So even though this practice has been done for decades, it's still struggling to gain legal authority because non-Indigenous governments don't value Indigenous law. Indigenous planning isn't seen as a separate and equal entity, meaning Indigenous planners can't implement their practices. So I also reviewed coexistence, which is a theory that offers a reframing of relationships in planning world between Indigenous and non-Indigenous governance structures. It recognizes Indigenous rights and cultural aspirations alongside non-Indigenous society. However, in coexistence, there are still some questions remaining um, on how to adopt it in practice to uphold those multiple distinct systems. And so my final body of literature was ethical space, which um, offers a possible framework to implement coexistence. It was first formally coined by Willie Ermine, who's a member of the Sturgeon Lake First Nation. An ethical space is an abstract space where worldviews can come together to meet as equals and to co-create new methods for decision-making. Uh, in this space, no system has more weight or legitimacy than the other, and it's been used um, in education, healthcare, and conservation, but there's been few practical applications in planning. So after my literature review, I established the following research methods to help achieve some of those research aims. Um, I conducted qualitative constructivist research, which just basically means that there's many different ways to know the world. Um, ethical space was the theoretical framework that guided my work, and I couldn't enact it um, in my actual research due to time constraints, but I adopted the guiding principles of the framework in all aspects of my work. Grounded theory was the methodological approach that I used for my case study. So in this theory, data collection and analysis are used to inform one another 
and they also happen at the same time. So it promotes um, reflexivity and lets research evolve as new information is learned. Then I used three methods for data collection, semi-structured interviews, document analysis, and reflection. Um, and I'll go into further details of those on the last, next slide. And I finally used grounded theory again to analyze my results. So for case study research, you need to include multiple methods um, to ensure validity and also account for bias. So I conducted semi-structured interviews, which was pre-established questions that really just facilitated open-ended discussion with my participants. And I categorized my participants into two groups. I had eight interviews with group one, which were practitioners of ethical space, and 12 interviews with group two, which were governments in the upper Columbia. Um, so next, I conducted a document analysis to really corroborate that information that I learned from my interview participants and fill in any gaps of understanding. So I reviewed documents from seven ethical space projects um, and a variety of government documents and websites that spoke to decision-making tools and concepts that shape land use planning in their jurisdictions. And finally, I took a reflexive approach to my research. So reflection is really that method of turning the research back onto yourself to promote understanding. So as I learned more information through my data collection, I reflected on those learnings and applied this to my research process. Okay, so to analyze my results, I came back to that grounded theory. I was situating and resituating my work as I learned more information. And I used um, what's called Envivo, a qualitative data software program, to find relationships between my data that spoke to ethical space in land use planning and also the legal landscape of the upper Columbia. So as both my data collection and my analysis was happening at the same time, I was adopting different codes um, and including and excluding relevant themes over time. And I separated these two codes between group one and group two. One limitation I wanna talk about is that I wasn't able to interview all governments with jurisdiction in the study site. And I tried to achieve as high a percentage of representation as possible um, but that could be a factor to skew my perceptions of Upper Columbia governance. So for my results, um, I categorized my results based on those two research aims. So first, I really wanted to gain a better understanding of what ethical space is and how to enact and maintain it in land use planning. So I identified three major themes in defining ethical space. And the first was co-creating new procedures using existing systems. So this is distinct in ethical space because it doesn't attempt to make people change their systems of understanding. These systems and beliefs are used to jointly create a new method for decision-making. The next theme was building meaningful relationships. And ethical space isn't intended to be used to fulfill consultation or legal obligations. It really can only be established when participants are committed to truly getting to know one another and building those relationships. And then finally, all interview participants talked about the importance of recognizing that there's no one size fits all approach to ethical space. All ethical spaces will look different depending on the participants, the topic, the location, where the decisions made. And so there's no real step-by-step -step guide for enacting ethical space. So for example, um, the image on the right is Michelle Sam's vision of a Tanaha ethical space, and on the left is Elaine Alex's love-based practice, which embodies an ethical space framework. So although these two look quite different from one another, they're both achieving ethical space in their work. Okay, so after I defined ethical space, I also found three key requirements to enact and maintain it, and that's pre-engagement, relational accountability, and reflexivity. So pre-engagement is the work that's done before entering the space. It's understanding your personal and your professional ethics and responsibilities. It includes conducting research to understand as much about the other participants as you can. 
Relational accountability is about developing meaningful relationships to establish trust and feel responsible for upholding your duties in that space. And, you know, ethical space is an ongoing process that requires continuous dialogue and engagement. And the final one was reflexivity. So this allows parties to check in with one another and ask what's working and what's not. Um, with this reflection, parties can be adaptable to ensure that the project is serving everyone. So next, I define my results of the analysis of governments in the Upper Columbia. And these are just a few key highlights. So 18 government bodies have jurisdiction in the area. And these governments have varying levels of interest and regulation. Most governments had some form of a guiding document that outlined their vision for the area, but they don't speak to how they want to engage other neighboring jurisdictions. Um, I do wanna note that bands and communities have been subjected to holding jurisdictional authority only over their reserve lands as defined by the Indian Act. And much of this land doesn't exist within the Upper Columbia study site because of colonization and the forceful removal of these populations. So although their documents might not have weight in a non-Indigenous framework within the Upper Columbia, uh, the plans through my research were viewed as guiding documents because I think that they must have weight in how we make decisions moving forward. Um, so moving on to relationships, um, there was quite a mix of responses with relationships between governments. Most local governments didn't have relationships with Indigenous governments outside of consultation protocol. The province said it was working to build relationships with Indigenous governments, but was a little bit vague in those responses. Um, local governments said there was little information sharing from the province and nation bands and communities spoke about their deep collaborations with one another. Um, most governments also said that community engagement was a really important piece for their work moving forward. Um, a lot of them spoke about the need to update old engagement techniques to um, attend to a wider audience. So specifically those who might part-time live outside of the community or all the time live outside of the community. Uh, all governments talked about the need for more collaboration for long-term planning. The province said that there's no strong direction to reopen full-scale regional planning, but it might change with modernized land use planning. And most governments want planning to use watershed boundaries instead of jurisdictional boundaries. So with these results, I theorized applying an ethical space framework to land use planning in the Upper Columbia. I identified four recommendations for Upper Columbia governments to enact ethical space. And I just wanna mention that um, these recommendations aren't intended to become part of like an action plan or anything because it's really impossible to know how ethical space will form without doing that work. So really they just identify common goals to help uh, relationship building. So recommendation one is that governments outline motivations and engagement strategies. From my research, I found little evidence of formal guidance used by Indigenous and non-Indigenous governments that outlines their engagement. So pre-engagement requires an understanding of oneself and also determining how you want relationships to look. All governments need to develop strategies to outline this. So for dominant uh, for non-Indigenous planners, the strategy might outline things like how they intend to uphold UNDRIP, the TRC calls to action or the DRIPA action plan. Recommendation two was to find common ground. This is important to assist in relationship building. And in BC, there's no requirements to conduct any cross-jurisdictional planning, even though these strategies can provide more sustainable long-term planning, resolve conflict and envision a collective future. In the Upper Columbia, most governments identified three topics that they're particularly interested in, which was backcountry use, watershed boundary planning, and issues of housing. So some of those goals, um, if you work together to achieve them, it might be a good starting point for building relationships. And the third recommendation is that dominant governments build relationships outside the consultation, uh, provincial consultative database. And I found most non-Indigenous governments engage Indigenous governments using only this database. 
which really is a colonial framework that forces indigenous governments to draw lines on a map that might not reflect their territories. So I'm recommending non-indigenous governments move away from conducting engagement exclusively using that and do their own research to identify um, different boundaries. So the indigenous led website Native Land could be a good starting point for this. And my last recommendation for today is that communities and local governments jointly conduct community engagement and planning. So for the Upper Columbia, many residents work and live in different jurisdictions. And other entities also move between these boundaries, you know, things like water, fire, and wildlife. So to plan without recognizing that movement presents challenges. And land use planning should reflect the needs of multiple populations and recognize movement between jurisdictions. And in ethical space, this work also holds those governments accountable to one another. So to wrap up, um, planners play a pivotal role in addressing ethical space, ethical issues across um, BC. And the practice of planning is rooted in creating a better, more sustainable world for everyone. So to really walk in solidarity with Indigenous peoples um, to achieve the goals of the modernized land use planning and those legal obligations in DRIPA, we need to adopt new planning methods that uphold Indigenous law. Now my thesis explored how ethical space could be this new method. And using a place-based approach, I um, identified some theoretical and practical applications in the Upper Columbia. Now ethical space is an emerging concept but it promotes relationship building and balancing power dynamics to establish um, what I think is an innovative space for decision making. It recognizes fundamental differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous authoritative structures, and it presents a new way forward for land use planning that really aligns with UNDRIP, the TRC calls to action, and the DRIPA action plan. So that's my presentation for today. I want to thank you all for listening, and I'll uh, pass it over to Nadine or Elaine for this. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Mo, um, for sharing this with us, this, this innovative, innovative space that we're talking about, ethical space. I think that was a great way to open up um, this workshop and this series uh, sort of the essence of the series that, that Y to Y has been trying to, you know, create this space. And I know this has been a really good journey for you. Thanks for pulling it all together into a 20 minute presentation for us. <laughs> um, Elaine, welcome. I'm not sure if did you have a presentation to share? I may share a diagram. Uh, okay. And let me just, I'm going to put my timer on because I'm a storyteller and I will talk forever. So I need to uh, put my timer on. Good day, elders, family, friends, leaders, young people, two spirit, and non binary folks. My name is Tithkanit, and I am from the Silk and Sihuatm nations. My name, Tithkanit, was given to me on the day I was born from my Tama, Elin Alec. It means standing by water. My English name is Elaine Alec. My late father was Saul Kenzie Basil from the Bonaparte Indian Band from the Sihuatl Nation. He was chief of the Bonaparte in the Indian Band in the 70s and also part of the Red Power Movement and American Indian Movement and was partially responsible for the shutdown of the Department of Indian Affairs offices in Vernon, BC in 1974. My late mother was Sophie Alec from the Penticton Indian Band from the Seal Nation. She was the daughter of the late Chief Jack Alec and Eileen Alec. My grandfather, Chief Jack Alec, was our first elected chief uh, when they introduced the chief and, elect, uh, chief and council election system. Uh, women were not allowed to be chiefs at the time. And so the matriarchs in my community came together and they chose my grandfather to be the first elected chief because he was married to my Tama, who was the daughter of Surimt. Um, and so he remained chief until he passed away. So if you've ever driven uh, along Highway 97 uh, into Penticton, uh, on the side of the highway, you'll see the provincial park Surimt, which means uh, moonlight glistening off the water. 
and uh, that is named after my great grandfather. And we are descendants of Pelkamulach and Kuthbak Jenten. Pelkamulach was one of our hereditary chiefs from the 1600s who resided in Washington state. He had 24 wives uh, from Washington into British Columbia, up to Williams Lake, to the ocean and over to the Rockies. So many of the hereditary leadership that you hear of from the interior are descended from uh, that, uh, my great, 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 great grandfather. So if you are indigenous from the interior, we may be related. <laughs> um, so I introduced myself like that for a number of reasons. One, I was told to by my elders. Two, I was told to speak my language in every public setting possible because there was a time when my mother and my grandparents were punished for doing so. I was also told to say the names of my ancestors out loud because it calls them into the space with me to help me speak uh, because being raised in a leadership uh, family with hereditary uh, blood, uh, we were taught to lead from the heart and speak from the heart that we are never to prepare anything that we're going to share everything needs to be shared from the heart because your heart never lies. Um, your heart will never lead you wrong and colonial settings and business settings and political settings tell us the opposite. They tell us you have to be perfect. You have to be prepared. You have to have everything set up properly before you can uh, lead. And it, that is the opposite for our communities. We, uh, we are raised to be strong in who we are and our identity and sense of belonging. Uh, we are trained from the age of four uh, to know who we are to feel the fear, face the fear and do it anyway. Uh, we are told to believe that we are born with everything we need to know in this world. That whenever we struggle, whenever we have a hard time and, and can't figure something out, that we're born with everything that we need to know to contribute to important decision-making. And so I, I let Mo know that I, I speak from the heart. I never prepare. I was gonna listen to uh, her work and then share uh, some of the approaches that I utilize in the work that I do. Um, I dropped out of school in grade nine. I, uh, I started smoking at the age of 10 and I started drinking at the age of 12. Uh, I became a raging alcoholic and I uh, experienced a lot of different abuses in my life as a child. Um, as a result of residential schools, my grandparents and my parents both went um, and were abused and assaulted. And that was the story for many of the people in my community. And so there was a lot of harm happening within my community growing up. And so I experienced abuse as a result of that. And it took me a lot to move out of that space to get to where I am today. I'm uh, 44 years old. I've been sober now for 14 years. Um, and I now own two companies. And uh, both of the companies that I own uh, are doing really well in the work that we, that we do. Uh, a lot of it is in planning. A lot of it is in decolonizing planning and consulting and business um, and learning to work from that place of love, trust and faith because colonial systems are built on fear and control. Everything that we do, policies, laws, the way that we do things, processes, all built on fear and control um, because we're afraid something might happen. So we put a system in place to control people. Um, and no good decisions are ever made from a place of fear. And so everything that we see that is built today is built on that fear and that control, even the way we do research, even the way that we, you know, academia is one of the most harmful places um, as a result of the colonial structures put in place to make people feel like they're not good enough or they don't know enough um, and to validate their way of knowing and being to someone else who sets the standards for how they should be, um, which is completely opposite to the way that I was raised. I didn't learn until I was 30 years old what a gift I received. Um, even though I went through those hard times, there was always something that held me back from uh, going too far, from, from going too far uh, to hurt myself or to be harmed. Um, and I believe it was because my grandmother raised me. My grandmother spoke only the language. She would rub my back at night when my mom would be drinking and she would leave me. I stayed with my grandma. My grandma would rub my back and tell me stories. And in the morning, she would get me to go to the water. She'd get me to go on the land and she'd tell me how to introduce myself to the land. She told me what I could eat on the land and what I had to keep away. And, and when I struggled, she told me the things that I needed to do based on our stories and, on our and in our language. And I thought that anybody who grew up with a grandmother on the reserve learned what I learned. 
but little did I know that my tama was a rebel, that um, people were being punished and persecuted for sharing our language and gathering and, and passing on those stories. And my tama was a rebel. She chose to continue to share those teachings with me. And I didn't realize those teachings were our ways of governing and decision making and, and a way of planning in the work that we do. And so when I was listening to the presentation, um, you know, ethical space and, and, and where it has and hasn't been used and how ethical space creates that kind of equal space of, of decision making of all different perspectives and views, I struggled with that a little bit when it comes to land. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit with you about why it's different when it comes to land. Um, because there's teachings around that. Our language talks about there are protocols and laws in place about who the decision makers are for that land. And there, when people are guests and visitors in that land, they don't make those decisions within that space. But the people who know the language to that land are responsible for taking care of all living beings within that area. So it doesn't matter whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. It doesn't matter where, whether you're Seal or Sihwatan. If you are a visitor within my territory where I know the language to, it is my responsibility to teach you um, how to live in reciprocity with the land so that you can live well and the land will continue to regenerate. Um, and so we had those protocols. When people came, we knew we had to go to certain people. So we had deer chiefs, we had salmon chiefs, we had berry chiefs, we had people that paid attention to the land and how it was used and how to regenerate it. And when people came into those territories, they knew who they had to talk to to respect those protocols on where you gather, where you fish, where you do those things. You can be here, you can take from the land um, as long as you know where you're taking from and how much you should be taking and what time of year you're taking from that. So the land will continue to regenerate. And so there was that understanding. It wasn't that somebody, it wasn't seen as a power dynamic. It was just the way it was. And we knew that was what we had to do in order for the land to regenerate so that it could continue to provide for all living beings who occupied that space. And so even in the word Timhulach, which is the, the name for land in our language, Timhulach means Timich and spirit the things that you can see and can't see. There's a concrete knowledge of all of those things. Um, and that whatever you know the language to, that mountain, that water, that rock, that valley, if you know the language to that mountain in your language, then you have responsibility over it because that language gives you the teaching and the law on how to keep that place regenerated. And so we had a responsibility to teach people, this is what you need to know while you're here and to pass on those teachings with each other. And so my, my great, 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 great grandfather, Pelkamula, who had those wives, it wasn't just to have a bunch of wives. Those marriages were protocols and agreements between nations that we made agreements that we would respect each other when we were in each other's territories. And so they were, they were decision-making uh, spaces to unite the nations so that we agreed to, to maintain these lands in a good way. And so, you know, when I think about that um, and I think about co-creating something new, um, and I think about the process that I based my cultivating safe spaces on, I based that work and that framework on a whole bunch of different facilitation styles that I've learned over the years. But the key teachings I took forward um, in this work is the Anaokin Wich. And Anaokin Wich is a decision-making process based on one of our creation stories um, before people were here. And Anaokin Wich means letting the knowledge drip into your head from all different voices. And that the more voices you hear, the more knowledge you have, the better decisions you make. But you have to keep an open mind. You're not allowed to close your mind to any of those drips. That Even if you don't agree with it, you still have to be open-minded to all of those things, listening with discipline without judging what somebody else is saying as right or wrong, good or bad. Can you listen with discipline to everybody in this space 
without judging what they're saying as right or wrong, good or bad, because their voice is important in this work. And now can wish is not about creating something new. And now can wish is um, clarifying what each and every one of us already knows. So we're all born with a voice. We're all born with perspective. We're all born with experience. We're all born with skill. And each and every one of us needs to contribute our voice into the place when we're making decisions um, so that we can all move forward together. And so it's based on this story that I'm gonna share with you. And I'm just gonna share my screen. So this diagram, Back in the 1980s, the elders from the Silk Nation came together um, to talk about which stories we needed to put into writing because we knew we were losing our speakers, we knew we were losing our teachers. And so our, our, our elders agreed at that time, these are the four most important stories we need to have written down. These are the stories we need to keep moving forward. This story is called the Four Food Chief Story. It's also called How Food Was Given. This story is about when there, there was animal people and they referred to us as the people to be. And so this was before the people to be were here. So um, there were four, before there were, were people here, there were four chiefs. Um, there was Chief Black Bear, who was chief of all things that walked on the land and flew in the air. There was Chief Bitterroot, who was chief of all things that grew below ground. There was Chief Saskatoon Berry, who was chief of all things that grew above ground. And there was Chief Spring Salmon, who was chief of all things that lived in the water. One day the creator came to the chiefs and said, there's going to be a being that comes and you have to figure out how to keep that being alive. So the creator left the being between the chiefs and left. And the chiefs looked at the being and they said, this is the most pitiful excuse for a being we've ever seen. It's born with no fur to keep it warm, no teeth to eat. It's born with nothing in its brain. It's helpless. How are we supposed to keep this being alive? It was a baby. So the chiefs sat there for a really long time and thought about it before they looked at Chief Black Bear and said, well, you're the oldest, you tell us what to do. And that's one of our very first teachings. Every time we make an important decision, we have to include our elders. And so Chief Black Bear sat there and thought about it for a really long time and said, I'm going to lay my life down for this being. Everything I am, it can have. It can have my meat. It can have my fur. It can have whatever it needs to keep itself alive. So all the other chiefs agreed that they would do the same thing. So Chief Black Bear said, I'm going to lay my life down now, and you have to sing me back to life. So Chief Black Bear laid their life down, and the chiefs came to sing their song but Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. Finally, all the other animal people came, deer and muskrat and squirrel, they all came to sing their song. Still Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. Finally, the last being came, let me sing my song, I wanna sing my song. Everybody swatted them away, go on, get out of here. Nobody wants to hear your song. All you do is eat crap and bug people. Nobody wants to hear your song. It was fly. Fly managed to come in anyway and sat on Chief Black Bear's ear and sang their song and Chief Black Bear came back to life. What that story tells us is that even the smallest and annoying and seemingly insignificant being, their voice and song was just as important as the Chief's voice and song. And that when we take the time and have the patience to listen to all of the voices that we're so powerful that we can bring back life. Fly represents the annoying one, the one that you don't like, the, the one that always shows up that you don't wanna to listen to. Um, their voice is just as important. But fly also represents that small and seemingly insignificant thought that you might have. The thing that you, don't, you think nobody wants to hear from you, that it's not important, that you're not as smart as everybody else, that it doesn't make sense, that I'm just gonna ramble. This story makes it a requirement for you to share your voice in song because it could be the one thing that's holding us back from bringing life back uh, to our people. And so, you know, one of the things our elders say is the state of the land is a reflection of the state of the people. 
and the state of the people is a reflection of the state of the land. And so many times we focus on other people and other things to change it, um, when the real work that we need to do has to come from within. So there's two questions that our people ask in every decision-making setting. That question is sweetan we and stima us. Sweetan we means who am I? Who are you? And it means more than just that. It means who are you? Who is your family? Who is your nation? Where do you come from? What land do you belong to? What are you good at? And what are you going to contribute to this space? And that was important for us to know. You don't just show up just to show up. You need to know who you are so you're confident in your decision making so that no matter what happens, you can use your voice, even if you're scared, that you use your voice to share what's on your heart. Um, and it, having knowing who you are and where you come from gives you a strong sense of identity and belonging that no one can take away from you. Um, and that can be really difficult for our settler allies. Because when we talk about reconciliation, people focus on Indigenous people, the Indian problem, that we're the ones that need healing. But Indigenous peoples in Canada only make up 3% of the population. And so if there's an issue in Canada, it's not Indigenous people. And when we talk about intergenerational and multi-generational trauma, it's not just Indigenous people that need healing. Because our settler ally, friends and relatives were displaced from their lands as well, displaced from their families, their communities and where they came from. And many times as a result of war and trauma, you know, orphans from other countries were brought to this place and, and put through horrific things. Um, and it was passed on generation to generation. And so many settler allies I know talk about, we don't talk about those things in our family. There's something that goes on and, and there's that disconnection from self and family in place. And when you have that, it's hard for you to be confident. It's hard for you to trust yourself and love yourself and show up in a place where you can be confident and include your voice. And so it's so easy for us to be colonized. It's so easy for us to get pulled into the system of one way is the only way is the right way. Um, and so when we talk about decolonizing and this work that we're doing, those two questions we start off by asking, reconciliation is not just about us fixing us, healing us, figuring out how to include us. It's who are you? Where do you come from? And how are you going to contribute to this from your place of strength and your place of knowing? And the second question our people ask they ask stimas uh, us, and that means what is on your heart, and that is uh, that is a requirement for you to show up to know what's on your heart. How are you feeling? How are you showing up in this space, um, so that you can make decisions from a good part in your brain? Because if you're not feeling good, if you're grieving, if you're going through a lot of stuff, it shows up in the way you make decisions. If you're struggling, if you're having a hard time it shows up in the way that you make decisions. There's no trust there. And so the process that we go through in this work is that, you know, yes, this is why it's important. Indigenous knowledge is important because our way of doing things is not about power. It's not about us having more jurisdiction or authority over you. That's not why we wanna, when we talk about land back, it's that responsibility we have to ensure that everybody understands those protocols, that everybody is learning those ways, um, and that, that we have that knowledge. We know those things. We know how to heal the land. We know how to how create that reciprocal relationship that will take care of all living beings. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your jurisdiction is, or what your title is that all living beings within this territory deserve to live well and deserve to live uh, within a place where people are, are treating each other um, in the way that they wanna be treated and developing that reciprocal relationship with the land, um, that respectful relationship with the land. And so when, when we say that we need to be at the table as part of this decision-making, that it's, that it's not just about um, including our voice, that it's a necessity for us to continue to 
keep this land regenerating. It's no longer an option. Um, and when we talk about upholding the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and how certain processes are upholding that, I'll say they are probably not. I will say they, they are probably not because self-determination means Indigenous people being able to make those decisions from that place, us upholding that knowledge and sharing that with others and others respecting those protocols and ways of being in the way that they do their work. If they're not, if self-determination upholding those things means just including our voice into your decision-making, but not upholding those things that we share, then we're not really being self-determining within our own lands and we're not really governing these spaces. Um, and we're still being held up to those colonial structures. It's just that the voice is there. That doesn't mean it's truly implementing um, what, the, what that means to uphold the United Nations Declaration on the rights of indigenous people. Um, and so, uh, so thankful to everybody who's here that the interest is so big to hear and listen to these conversations and these contributions and to students and, and people who are moving through the academ uh, academia setting, because it's hard. It's hard on the spirit, it's hard on the soul, it's hard on you know, your, your mental health um, and it's tough. And we really need to acknowledge um, our young people who get through that um, to hold up the work that they do. Um, as that starting point, then that you're taking the time to learn and listen and do this work in the best way that you can and be open to that. And knowing that the work you do is good um, and that no one else can validate that for you. Um, and so just holding up all of the students who are going through that process because it is hard on the spirit. Um, and I respect you uh, very much for being able to, to move through that and show up and, and still uh, work from that place of love and openness. So white lim lim. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you making the time because I know you have you have lots um, going on, um, but to share your story and these stories and, and your wisdom um, with everybody here. So we have time for questions now. And I'm going to invite people to ask their questions verbally um, by unmuting yourself. And uh, we have, I don't know if other people noticed, but there's this, Brittany informed me, there's this little glitch with uh, Zoom, which is if I think a lot of people used uh, a link that Mo provided them. And so we have several Mo Nadeaus. Um, and you might not even know that your name is showing up as Mo Nido. So it's really not a big deal. But um, if you write in the chat, it's going to look like you're Mo Nido. <laughs> so yeah, and it's just uh, nice to know who's here today. So if you have a question to please um, uh, just go ahead. Um, if we have lots of questions, we'll raise hands. And um, you can also put questions in the chat if, if that's your preference and you may feel more comfortable um, that way. Please do feel free to go ahead and put uh, questions in the chat. So we'll just open it up. Questions for either Mo or Elaine or comments. And there, I think there may have actually been a question in the we, chat. We did have one from Morris Prosser earlier, and it was for Mona Doe. Um, how do you classify, or how did you classify projects to determine if they were ethical space projects? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so my starting research happened um, through my mentor, Gwen Bridge, and she's an ethical space practitioner in BC doing a lot of um, planning related work in that space. And so um, a lot of what I learned was kind of through her. So finding um, different practitioners who are doing work through her and also um, some of the projects she was working on. Um, but really, as I was learning more of that information about what is ethical space, I started seeing that there were, 
you know, these similar principles of what Elaine's been saying of, you know, respectful communication um, and open dialogue between people. And so those were really some, some major components of, um, you know, kind of requirements, I guess, or, or a criteria that I used to um, think about practitioners or projects in that work. So, um, for example, um, the collaborative work that's happening right now for the Salmon Reintroduction Initiative is a really great example that um, operates under multiple governments, um, both non-Indigenous and Indigenous governments working together to hear each other's voices, um, to make decisions, to introduce salmon back into the waterways in the interior. So um, that was kind of one, just one example of how I, uh, yeah, determined that criteria. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have a Mo Nadeau guest who has their hand up. Uh, you probably know who you are. So um, if you wanna unmute yourself and, and tell us your real name and ask your question or comment, that'd be great. I'm not sure if I'm the one, if there's other people with their hand up or if it's me. <laughs> it's you. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, hi, Tanse. Uh, I'm Kamala Todd. Um, and also working in the area of planning, primarily with the city of Vancouver, and really love and appreciated what you shared, Elaine, around decision makers and how it is the rights and title holders of people who have the names for places, who have those connections and relationships as the ones who make decisions. And so I'm actually supporting the UNDRIP work right now, the city of Vancouver with the host nations. And just that really big question right now around, um, you know, different models or different ideas and approaches, you know, from of course, let's just completely, you know, get rid of the city of Vancouver altogether. You know, I personally don't really recognize its jurisdiction as a sort of imposed colonial system, <laughs> but of course, that's the reality we work within. So there's looking at the Vancouver Charter and all the different ways of looking at, you know, shared decision making and what that can look like. So I'm just curious your thoughts, you know, in an urban setting. Um, I know your territories also have municipalities or, you know, different jurisdictions there, but some of the ways through that, you know, in different, as we're at that point of, as you say, with UNDRIP and, you know, who needs to be the decision makers, um, you know, the reality of having all these various people who claim jurisdiction on, on other people's lands, you know, what are some of the ways we can, can work through that, if, if you have thoughts on that? I, okay. think, I think this was like the, I think the answer to that is what Mo was hoping I would cover in my presentation, and then I ended up uh, getting caught up in the story, but the, the work that I do is based on that story. And so that's my engagement approach. That's my communications approach. That is how I set my agenda approach is based on that story. Each of those chiefs represents a perspective type. And so there's the traditional perspective, which is, are the knowledge keepers. Um, they're also the corporate memory of an organization um, who are storytellers. If you ask them a question, they're gonna be like me and go on and on. Uh, there's the relationship perspective who care about connections and relationships and they don't care how long the process is going to take. There's the innovation perspective who are those who like systems change, who are usually policy people who want to work from the inside and figure out a shift. They're thinkers. They need a lot of time to think and process. And there's the action people, the action people who are saying, I'm tired of talking about it. Let's just get something done. Let's get it on paper. Let's get it implemented. What does that look like? The process recognizes all of those perspectives are important in making decisions. And so the process requests that you start in a circle and you keep the circle to at least 30 people or less, um, no more than like you can probably do 40, but it's going to take you all day um, to do a, a circle for it. So people, 30 people or less, and you start off by asking everybody in that group that question, who am I and what is on my heart? Um, and how am I coming into this space or what is important to me? So you start off every meeting with who, who am I, what is on my heart and what is important to me? And every person gets an opportunity to share who they are and what's on their heart and what's important to them as far as this conversation goes. 
and that opening circle can be seen as the as the uh, people will share the current state of where they're at. They will share the future state of where they think they should be, and they might also touch on SWAT strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. If you're listening with discipline to every single person that's sharing in that circle. And so a lot of times when people say introductory circle, it's going to take an hour and a half or two hours. Like, how do we get down to business? What is this going to take? But that piece right there, who am I? What is on my heart and what is important to me to start off any decision-making space helps people build that trust, helps establish the current state, um, maybe even the future state, but it also helps foster a sense of belonging and connection to each other as people share what's on their heart. And this is the purpose for that, is that when people are experiencing fear, cumulative stress, triggering PTSD, they live in the lower part of their brain. And you're only working from 5% of your brain when you're there. You can't focus, you can't concentrate, you're emotional, you can't think straight. The only way to move out of the trauma brain and the emotional brain is to cultivate a sense of safety, connection, and belonging. And so the whole purpose of that opening is to cultivate that sense of safety, connection, and belonging so that we can all move into the executive part of our brain and contribute in a really meaningful way to the work that we're doing. So the opening the first day, I spend time doing that. The second part of the day is breakouts where people self-identify which group you belong in. I'm a traditional perspective. I'm a relationship perspective. I'm an action perspective. I'm a traditional perspective. And they get the same questions to work on. Sometimes they don't, that's too much for me to get into right now, but you can give each group the same set of questions and they're gonna move through those questions really quickly and they're gonna understand each other and know how to work through that. And then when they present back, you'll see how every perspective fills out the whole plan. And they're gonna, everybody's gonna carry a piece of pulling that plan together. And that's that communal approach to decision-making is that there is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. Every, there is no leader. There is no decision maker. Everybody is contributing their voice. Everybody has an opportunity to do that. And all we do, the main protocol of that process is to listen with discipline to every single person. And so that's kind of like a really quick five minute shot of like the process I utilize and practice in everything I do. I use it with government. I use it with nations. I use it with corporations. I do a lot of work with the province of BC um, and the government of Canada as a contractor in planning. And I use this process every single time. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Maria, you have your hand up if you'd like to go ahead. Sorry, uh, right here. Um, all right. So um, I have a question for Mo, and it's with regards to the um, ontology and epistemology and, and the methodology that you used. And um, based on my experience, I will have to say that um, we're moving from constructivism to social constructivism. And I wanted to know um, if you touch. On, the, on that particular one, on social construct, constructivism. And um, when you using land use planning, we, if you think that we may also look at the axiology and ontology of pragmatism, because we're trying to solve a problem for two groups at least um, when we're in land use planning. So did you come to, uh, you know, to the next level of what could, um, frame the next generation of land use planning as we move along. The way that I imagine is that ethical space is the thread that keeps that together, but we have other components that keep evolving. I think the principle of ethical space has to be there in order to function. It's like the vertebra of, of this, but the pieces are evolving. So if you could expand a little bit more on, on that, that would be great, thanks. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, a really great question. And it sounds like you have probably a better grasp on all of the different um, social research method theories than, than I probably do. But 
I'll do my best here. Um, I guess I'll start with saying that I kind of see ethical space as really being that that main piece because it, to me it, it just comes back to some really basic um, principles and conversations of, of respect and, and open dialogue and so um, yeah when you were saying it's kind of that vertebrae I, I think that um, that's kind of all that maybe is is needed in in that sense you know I, I see land use planning as um, being so different depending again on who's involved and um, what's the objective of the group and you know how are these how are people coming together to define things and so I, I almost don't know if there's like a one framework that's that's specifically fitting in for you know kind of these step-by-step -step protocols or anything but when we think and take a step back to what ethical space is is really that it's allowing multiple systems to have separate and equal weight in in how we make decisions and in how we come together um, and how we have this this dialogue and so um, yeah so I, I guess that's kind of where I see it coming from ethical space standpoint in land use planning I, I see it as the actual practical application of some of these you know, planning theories that have um, that have come through within collaborative planning or in coexistence. I really do see it as this practical application because I think it's just that framework for us to have the conversations. And then once we can have respectful conversations where we are listening to everyone and we are engaging to to create that common goal that we've identified, I think that that's where some of that organic and and I think beautiful conversation can come for it to implement. Um, planning. But from the constructivist framework, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not actually as familiar. I, I tried to kind of stay more into that zone of constructivism and and just, re just really embody that, that main idea that there are many ways to, um, many different ways to, to see things and to, to see spaces and to, to think and to identify um, visions and goals and, and belief structures. And so that's that's why I stuck with um, constructivism is because I thought it, it provided that opportunity for me to, to come in with as much of an open mind as I could. So when I was doing the interviews and the document analysis, I could reflect and just absorb as much as I could through that. So. I hope that helps answer um, a little bit of your question, but thanks for bringing that up, Maria. Thanks, Mo. And we'll take, I think, one more question here before we have some time for discussion into uh, the, the break breakout rooms. And it's from Hannah. Hannah, do you want to ask a question or would you like me to read it from the chat? Um, I could ask. I guess that's a little more personal. Yeah, yeah so um, Elaine had mentioned knowing yourself and what you can bring to the table, what you can offer. So I'm doing work with Skeetches and Indian Band, and I feel like because I'm a guest on their territory, I need to listen and learn as much as I can. Um, so I know that I do have some things to offer, but I don't want to overstep. So do you think there are situations where it's appropriate to just listen and not necessarily offer perspective or your knowledge on something, especially in someone else's territory? Um, I, I read there's two questions in the chat I was reading. I was like, oh, that's I can't answer those questions really quickly. Um, but I, my I just go back to a teaching about trusting your gut instinct, your spirit. Um, the teaching that we're connected to our spirit through our belly button and that's our instinct and when we feel it in our gut that's our spirit helper telling us it's time for us to speak but often we misinterpret it as fear and so we don't say anything um, but to push past that and trust your body that your body and your spirit are telling you to speak in those moments when you're in those spaces where people are sharing and talking to be there listening with discipline but pay attention to your body when you feel that gut instinct to speak, even if you don't know what you're going to say, even if you're just get your hands get sweaty, your, your tummy starts to feel a little bit funny, um, just put your hand up 
And then when it's your turn to speak, you just speak and you trust your instinct and what you're going to share. That's your spirit talent giving you permission. Um, but also if you're invited into the territory to do work there, um, I think that's kind of unspoken uh, protocol with people. We've invited you into our territory to do this work with us and we value you and your voice and in and, and that space. And so recognizing that, that the first protocol is showing up and listening with discipline and then paying attention to your gut when, uh, when, when it's time for you to speak. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. And we did have, yes, one more um, question in the chat, which is a very good one. I noticed this person um, needed to leave, but uh, specifically about reconciling issues between nations like overlap, uh, which is a colonial con construct, but has real implications on every level of decision-making or governance. And a question and comment that comes up um, very often <laughs> uh, in British Columbia and the upper Columbia region. Um, we, we are going to shift just slightly in to, you know, to kind of move this conversation into small groups where we can really um, reflect a little bit and, and digest a little bit and create a space for people who may be more comfortable kind of in, in a smaller a smaller room. So, okay, welcome back everybody. I think we have everybody back other than those who needed to leave. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you um, for challenging yourselves. I know that can be uh, sometimes challenging in small rooms. Thank you for listening to each other and learning together. Um, Elaine needed, needed to leave, um, but uh, I think we all very much appreciated Elaine's words. I know for me, um, just as she was leaving, you know, I told her this when she said, your heart will never lead you wrong. Um, is something I'm definitely taking away fr from today and that all voices are important. I hope in the breakout rooms, everybody had a chance for their voices to be important um, and heard. And if that wasn't the case to think about that for the next time you're in breakout rooms. Um, and I think she also sent the message of really to think about how you, how we all contribute um, in this world today and the many challenges that we're facing and the solutions that, that we can offer. Um, Mo, I also really wanna thank you for being here and helping us think about the conversations and the processes we need to have for all living things um, and how to think about community and that land-based planning and that there is no one size fits all. Um, and also I think something really taking is that this pre-engagement, pre-engagement is so very, very important. We often um, talk about engagement, but the work that you do um, before engaging um, is so very, very critical. Sorry, my screen just quit on me. So now I'm having to move, <laughs> move you all around. I couldn't see you all for a moment. <laughs> um, but it really, I think what I'm taking uh, from today is how much, how so much of this is about being in tune with yourself. Um, with your community and with the land, you know, just really tuning in at, at the gut level, at the heart level. Um, and of course, our minds are always going, thinking through this. Uh, we'd like to thank the Vancouver Foundation and the Sitka Foundation who have been supporting these workshops and this work um, that Wide has been, been doing to try and bring ethical space um, more into practice in our communities in British Columbia. Um, you know that this session is recorded because it gave you that warning um, and we'll follow up by sending you that by email. And we're also going to put that on our webpage. So y 2 ynet forward slash ethical space is um, kind of that landing page where we have a bunch of recordings of different sessions as well as um, other resources. And we do have some other workshops coming up. Um, one of them actually is on the Bringing the Salmon Home initiative, which Mo mentioned earlier. We tentatively have that lined up for November 22nd. Uh, we're still confirming the exact date and time. And also doing one on buffalo consciousness and the buffalo, the formation of the Buffalo Treaty. Um, if anyone's heard a, a little bit about that, we'll have a whole uh, session on that October, either October 4th or 5th. Again, we'll, 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 conf we'll confirm that. And those will be posted on that webpage. 
Um, if you're not signed up for Y to Y news, um, the great way to be on the email list to be notified when these events are happening. So please do that and I'll also put that in a follow up email. And the last thing I would like to ask of you is we really appreciate your feedback on this session and on these sessions. Um, it's something we at Y2Y have um, been hosting and with the turnout that we have and the feedback we've had so far, we um, would like to continue that, but your feedback helps us cater it to your needs and your interests and your ideas to have other potential speakers or workshops. So we have us, um, we're working with an organization called Reciprocal, Reciprocal Consulting, Indigenous owned um, research and evaluation organization. And so we'll put this link in the chat, there it is. Thank you, Brittany, I'll also put it in, in an email. Um, and for some extra motivation for you to share your feedback, we will put everyone's name in a draw for a conservation oriented prize that I will send you in the mail. We'll randomly select someone. So um, thanks so much for being here and thanks so much uh, for your um, contributions and for participating in this great important process of ethical space. Have a good rest of your afternoon. <laughs>